Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live. Uh, I'm here with Tobias Ernie. His background is in chemical, pharmaceutical uh, industry of Basel. And uh, he actually took Ibogaine in 2006 for detox. And that actually helped immerse him uh, in, in the field of Ibogaine therapeutics. And so it's my pleasure and uh, my privilege to introduce you to, to Tobias. He has a great presentation. I'm going to hop off camera and... Uh, Thank you so much. I'm really stoked for this talk. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm going to um, present on microdosing of Iboga and Ibogaine. It's uh, for me and for much many others also a prototype tool for consciousness hacking. And I'm going to also um, elaborate its neuropharmacological implications. So Iboga is most likely known to mankind since the dawn of human consciousness. Um, but the real ignition in the Western world marked, um, was marked by the discovery of the anti-addictive properties by Howard Lotzoff. Mm, and subsequently, the scene got propelled by the advent of the Internet and in the last years is gaining massive momentum through the opiate crisis as well as the psychedelic renaissance. So a common approach are the so-called full flood doses which are pretty high dosed and enormously intensive, potentially lethal and several day lasting near death experiences. These are super effective due to their profound quality of conveying deep spiritual insights, as well as their ability to neuropharmacologically restructure the brain. <clears throat> this drastic measure is often a last resort uh, because of the potential dangers uh, the intensity, the time involved, as well as the high costs, these high dose experiences tend to appeal to very desperate people, people standing at the edge of the abyss, or psycho spiritual hardcore explorers that uh, like to explore the outskirts of infinity. Um, but for common persons who are not very involved in shamasochistic practices, uh, such drastic measures are not necessarily their first choice of spending their free days. Um, but Iboga has so much more to offer, also and especially in the lower dose regimes. A uh, wide variety of utmost healing and beneficial effects are accessible with micro and mini doses. So this talk will shed some light on the different pharmacological implications and resulting possibilities of application. Um, first, I want to explore a bit the history of Iboga microdosing in Bwiti and in the African culture. So the origins of taking lower doses of Iboga are found with the pygmy tribes and the Bwiti traditions of Western equatorial Africa. For them, the root bark of the Tabernante Iboga shrub is a herbal multi-tool, um, some kind of a naturopathic leather man, and is used as medicine, as aphrodisiac, as stimulant, as well as catalyst for spiritual initiations. So traditionally, very high doses are given during several day lasting near-death experiences. Mm. But besides these initiations, smaller doses are used for a wide variety of indications, uh, such as, for example, in case of toothache, um, the root bark is chewed um, and it numbs the mouse. So Iboga is used as a painkiller or as a soft anesthetic. And during hunting, small amounts of Iboga are being um, eaten to sharpen the senses, to increase the intuition, um, to center and ground oneself, <clears throat> and to have more access with hunting. Uh, since it always suppresses hunger and thirst, the hunters can go stalking for days. <clears throat> also, small amounts are used as potent aphrodisiacs and for heavy labor. So um, small amounts are eaten to increase the strength and to prolong the stamina. 
uh, the German colonists encouraged the consumption of small amounts of iboga in the south of Cameroon when they were building the um, railroad from Yaounde to Douala. Uh, so they saw that the workers worked much harder, better and stronger. Um, and this was very liked by the Germans, so they encouraged even the use of iboga. <clears throat> Uh, the anthropologist Otto Gollenhofer, ah, sorry, no, James Fernandez, um, wrote a book, Buiti, uh, an ethnography of the religious imagination in Africa. Here we see him with an incredibly ridiculous head. Um, in his book, he um, describes how outstandingly happy pygmy tribes taught the use of iboga to the ethnic group of the Fang. So this indicates that there must be some benefit um, on the mood, some alleviation or some brightness for the mood. <clears throat> and initiated Buitis take small doses in weekly ceremonies um, where they dance and celebrate together for the whole night. Um, and in these ceremonies, the collective achieves a state of what they call one-heartedness. Uh, so the weekly use of small doses of iboga is part of their spiritual housekeeping. So beside the initiatory use of iboga, there is a broad range of traditional low-dose implications for ingesting iboga. Uh, summarized, the reasons are to gain energy, to heal, to strengthen, um, to regulate emotionally in the direction of a brighter mood, and to sharpen the senses, as well as to sharpen the consciousness. Um, later, I will show that this is not Bushman superstition um, to be looked down upon, but has some rock solid pharmacological background, like a lot of medicines coming from the future therapeutic treasure chests of the rainforest. There is so much more to it than superstition. So, um, this short excursion into the African tradition shows that the low-dose regimes are basically as old as the use of iboga. Uh, nothing new, but something that was rediscovered and redefined by some courageous Western explorers like Howard Lotzov, um, which leads us to the history of low-dose regimes in the Western world, in the Occident. <clears throat> so the Western tradition uh, of Lodos Iboga, or General Iboga, um, the first period of Western Iboga research reaches from 1984, uh, 1864, sorry, to 1905. So during this, the plant was discovered, classified, and researched. And in 1901, Dibowski and Landrin, as well as Haller and Eckel, isolated ibogaine as the main active alkaloid. After a brief research in France, the rec recommendation to use the newly discovered alkaloid for the treatment of various ailments such as neurasthenia, um, the sleeping sickness, and the aid of convalescence um, were basically brought out. But later, um, the iboga shrub fell into oblivion for around about 40 years till 1939, um, where a preparation called Lambarain, um, so named after the place where Dr. Albert Schweitzer um, about built his jungle hospital. Here we see Dr. Albert Schweitzer with his personal pelican, whose name was Parsifal. <clears throat> so this medication, Lambarain, um, was produced until 1969 and was based on 0 0.2 grams of extract of the Tabernante Mani, which is a close relative to Tabernante Iboga. So each capsule or each tablet contained round about 8 milligrams of Ibogaine. So it seems pretty fair to say that the starting point of Western Iboga microdose was marked by Lambarin in France. Uh, the indications to take Lambarin um, were depression, exhaustion, and the wish to generally improve uh, one's immune system. 
uh, even athletes use Lumberin to enhance their um, performance. Then between 1967 and 1970, the World Health Assembly, basically um, the executive organ of the WHO, uh, classified pretty much all psychedelics as dangerous um, because the US asked them to do so. Nevertheless, later, um, Claudio Naranjo experimented with medium doses of Iboga and Ibogaine. Uh, he experimented in the range from four to five milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And in the 60s, uh, 69, he filed also a patent for the therapeutic use of Ibogaine. He assumed wrongly that Ibogaine is an MAO inhibitor, which still somewhat makes it rounds in the internet, but now is proven um, that it's not an MAO inhibitor. <clears throat> but again, the sustained momentum of Iboga and Ibogaine microdose in the West uh, was ignited by the Iboga detox movement back in the 80s and 90s. Um, the idea was to prolong the afterglow of the detox initiations and thus to counteract the possible re-emerging craving. Um, the first generation of Iboga providers observed that after the Nora Ibogaine had worn off, junkies had again the first subtle thoughts of drugs and latest, when the post, uh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome kicked in, um, the old routines and cravings often surfaced again. So to counteract this, the pleasant afterglow was prolonged with small doses given every now and then. This created longer windows of opportunity, uh, longer phases to recalibrate and override the self destruction self-destructive thought patterns and to restructure the rewardment system of the brain. Until a couple of years ago, Iboga was little known outside of the detox scene. And a decade ago, there was relatively little experimentation uh, in the recreational psychonautic scene. But due to the psychedelic renaissance and the general emerging of plant medicines, Iboga is increasingly able to free itself from the stigma of being exclusively a chunky medicine, especially microdosing is a much easier access to psychedelics in general, also to Iboga for a broader range of people. So having now briefly covered um, the traditional as well as the occidental history of microdosing Ibo Iboga and Ibogaine, I want to elaborate a bit of the neuropharmacological background. <clears throat> um, Iboga, Ibogaine and its metabolite nor Ibogaine are quite unique in their neuropharmacological profile. So common psychedelics like um, various forms of DMT, including psilocin and psilocybin, also LSD, mediate their effect mainly through the serotonergic receptor trends a neurotransmitter system. Uh, most of them are 5-HT2A receptor agonists. So basically these substances are imitating um, serotonin. Some other compounds like ketamine target the NMDA receptor of the glutamate system and the really exotic uh, psychedelics like cyanurine A, for example, mediates um, the effect via the kappa opiate receptor. Um, which is already pretty strange, but Ibogaine targets all of them above, plus some more. So um, this wide range of neuropharmacological action is pretty unique and makes Iboga microdosing interesting for a wide range of applications. Uh, first, a quick overview of what Ibogaine and nor Ibogaine are doing and then a bit more detailed what we use it for. 